Hey everybody. Hey everyone. Pastor Joey and Meredith Zamora. Hey, we just wanted to say Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Hey, listen, this has been such a different Christmas season and we know it's been hard for many people in right. different ways, but we wanted to today just give you a little bit of something to help celebrate the Christmas mm -hmm. season. So we had a few of our friends who were able to come and join us for today's service. And we're so excited to show you who they are and what they've got and just what they're going to do. So some of you know um, Brian Poppins, who is a fabulous award-winning awesome. musician. And, and we got Alan Cruz. Yes. And so you're going to get to see them along with some of our friends and some well wishes from all around the world. And so Cornerstone Church, Tri-Cities, we love you. We hope you are having the best Christmas ever. Perfect. Merry Christmas from our family to yours. Hey, Cornerstone Tri-Cities family, Brian Poppin here coming to you live from my home right here in Nashville, Tennessee. I want to wish you a merry, merry Christmas. Oof, we made it. God is still good in spite of anything that you've endured, been through, or seen this year. He's faithful and he's good. And I want to celebrate not only his goodness, but I want to celebrate Christ, our Savior. I want to give a shout out to my friends, Pastors Joey and Meredith. Thank you for having me with you virtually. We still connected in spite of it all. So we're going to take, like this song I'm going to play for you on piano right now is called Oh Holy Night. And just imagine angels bowing down, angels worshiping the birth of our Savior. So I'm going to ask you if we could fall on our knees together and cry out because he's worthy and worship as one family right now. And we can say, take our fear, our frustration, our anxiety, our confusion, take all of it at the altar. And we throw up our hands and say, God, I surrender to you. Come on, let's worship together. Merry Christmas, family. Let's go. Five, four, three, two, one.
Merry Christmas, Quarterstone Church. Kelly and Esther Lorkey here from the Cure Church in Kansas City, and we want to greet you on this Christmas Eve service. Pastor Joey Meredith, we love you guys so much. We know tonight is going to be a special night as you honor the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The way the world is now, we need to honor and celebrate Jesus and let our light shine and see lives change. Let the Lord use you and speak to you this Christmas Eve service. Have an amazing service. We love you all. Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. Hello, everybody. Just want to take a moment right here and wish everybody at Cornerstone Church Tri-Cities in Pasco, Washington, yes. home of two of the greatest people I know, Pastor Joey and Meredith Zamora. We want to wish you a very Merry Christmas all the way from the Master's House Church here in Victoria, Texas. Yeah. Cornerstone Tri-Cities, we wanted to wish you a very Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas from all of us here at LIBG Ministries. Love you guys. Hey, 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 Cornerstone Tri-Cities, I just want to wish you a Merry, Merry Christmas all the way from South Africa. We are right here. We are having our summer holiday. This is what we're doing right now, but I thought that this is a brilliant moment just to send our regards, our loves all the way to where you guys find yourself. It's still one of my favorite churches, still one of the best places to be at, and you still have got some of the most amazing pastors that has ever walked this planet. So come on, from our house to yours we just want to say Merry Merry Christmas I know it was a hectic year I know a lot of things happened I know a lot of things went uh, went wrong but hey this is it we're still here we're still breathing that means there's still hope and with God come on anything is possible have an awesome Christmas from our side from my house our house to yours enjoy it Merry Christmas and we love you guys a lot Hi everyone, this is Pastor Hector and Rosie Hernandez here at Powerhouse Church in Orange County, California. And we just want to wish Pastor Joey and Meredith Samara a Merry Christmas. Along with Cornerstone Church and a Happy New Year. Take care and God bless you all. God bless. Hello, Pastor Joey and Meredith. Hi. Megan and I just want to wish you and Cornerstone Church a Merry, Merry Christmas. We love you guys so much. We just know that this is going to be the best season for you. Love you so much. God bless you. Have a great service. Look forward to seeing you. Merry Christmas. Hello, this is Jeff and Nicola Smith. And we serve as pastors here at Strong Tower Church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And we want to take this moment and wish our dear friends, Pastors Joey and Meredith Zamora, along with the entire Cornerstone Tri-Cities Church, a Merry, Merry Christmas. We're praying for you, Tri-Cities, that you enjoy your Lord and that you enjoy your family and really, really be refreshed this holiday season. Although this has been an unusual year, may we all remember the unparalleled gift that we have in Emmanuel, God with us. And may his love, joy, and peace surround you. And may this upcoming year, may God take you above and beyond anything that you could expect or imagine. We're cheering for you way over here on the East Coast. May God bless you richly. Hola primos, ¿cómo están? Hello everybody there. Hope you have the best Christmas. We want to take this moment just to wish you the best. To say hello to all the church there. We love you. We send our love and we wish the best of the best for the next year for you. Feliz Navidad a todos. Familia de Cornerstone Tri-Cities. Dios los bendiga. Hasta pronto. Hello family, this is Christina and I'm Sam Segundo and we pastor right here in Big Spring, Texas, the Family Faith Center. We want to wish Pastor Joey and Meredith and the entire congregation at Cornerstone Tri-Cities Merry, Merry Christmas. We are so excited to celebrate the spirit of the holidays with you and just want to remind you, don't forget that Jesus truly is the reason for this season. So spread the love, Merry Christmas. And Happy New Year. Pastors Joey and Meredith and the entire Tri-Cities Cornerstone family, 
On behalf of our entire church here at Church on the Living Edge, we want to wish you all a most blessed Christmas season with anticipation that 2021 will be a breakthrough year for all of us. We love you dearly. We celebrate you. We look forward to seeing you real soon. Have a Merry Christmas. Hey, Tri-Cities, Cornerstone Church. We are so glad to be coming to you. Bishop Michael Pitts here and Pastor Kathy. We just want to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. Hope you are all finding new ways to celebrate the birth of our Savior with your family. Things are looking so different for so many of us this year, but God is still with us. The presence of God is still with us, and Jesus came to the earth, and that alone is worthy to be celebrated. This Christmas season is really a time of wonder. It's really a time of revelation, and it's also a time really of celebration. And as Kathy was saying, it looks a little bit different this year, but I believe that we're actually now preparing for what's gonna happen in 2021. And 2020 threw everything at you guys and everyone else that it possibly could throw, and you're yeah. still standing. Yeah. And I believe 2021 is gonna be significant. You know, in, in, the, in the story of Daniel, uh, in the book of Daniel, that there was a warfare in the heavenly realm for 21 days before the breakthrough happened. So I'm believing that the year 2021 is going to be a divine year of breakthrough for everyone. But anyway, we love you guys. You know that. We love your pastors. Joy and Meredith Zamora are really something else. Wonderful things are happening in their lives through you and with you. And we're believing God for great things. We wanted to say Merry Christmas. By the way, Christmas Eve is Kathy's birthday. No presents. She's been very naughty. <laughs> See you guys. Bye. Hey, everybody. Hang on. We've got something really great for you. Up next is our friend Shane Willard, who has got an incredible teaching on the history of Christmas and why some of this is so important to know. And so hang on. Watch this piece with us, and we'll be back in just a minute. You guys going to enjoy him. God bless. Hi, my friends. Your friend Shane Willard here. I have some thoughts about Christmas. As, as we enter into the Christmas season, um, as always, we take time and celebrate the birth of, of Jesus Christ. And anytime I bring anything, I want a couple things to happen. I want Jesus to get bigger, the cross to work better, the resurrection to be central, and scriptures to get bigger, not smaller. In Luke chapter 2, we have Luke's account of the Christmas story. And, and what we're going to find is Luke's account of the Christmas story has an interesting historical backdrop to it. I, and I'd like to tell you that story today and then reread Luke's account, understanding some of the history underneath the story. In, in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says, In the days of Caesar Augustus, there went out a decree that all the world should be taxed. In the days of Caesar Augustus. Augustus. So, so Jesus comes into the world in a certain place, at a certain moment, at a certain time, in a certain environment with, with a guy who said that he was God in flesh. There was so much propaganda around Caesar Augustus in the days of Caesar Augustus. One um, Roman historian, a guy named Virgil, this is what he wrote about Caesar Augustus, that Caesar Augustus was God in flesh, fully incarnate. The only way for the world to be saved was through the name of of Caesar Augustus. Does that sound familiar in some of the language? The only name in which men can be saved is the name of Caesar Augustus. Now, in the Christmas story, there are some main characters. Uh, there, there's a guy named Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was amazing. He combined the whole world under one rule. He, um, he invented the salad. He also, he, he also was the guy that said he was God in flesh. So, so when Rome thought about Julius Caesar, they didn't think about a man. They thought about a man who was the fullness of God incarnate. It was Julius Caesar. Caesar. Of course, Julius Caesar ends up getting killed by being stabbed in the back by his best friend. That sort of hurt his God claims. The idea was is that if you were actually God in flesh, you should have seen that coming. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. So Julius Caesar combines the whole world under one rule. He has a great nephew named Octavius. Octavius rescued Julius Caesar from behind enemy lines in a place called Gaul. Julius Caesar was so moved by this that he adopted Octavius as his son. Now the idea is, is that if Julius Caesar's God, now Octavius is the son of God. And as the son of God, he should be worshipped. Now, when Octavius took over the empire after the death of Julius Caesar, he took on the name Caesar Augustus. The third main character is a guy named Herod the Great. 
Now, Herod the Great was a guy that took the side of Julius Caesar in a civil war between Julius Caesar um, and Pompey. This worked out great because Julius Caesar ended up winning the civil war and he rewarded Herod the Great as the token king of all of Israel. And so the main character so far is you have God in flesh, the son of God in flesh, and a king put in charge of an entire nation by God in flesh and the son of God in flesh. Now, Herod the Great dies in around 4 BC, and um, Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, the whole Roman um, Empire, they reward Herod the Great and his sons by dividing the Israelite kingdom in between three jurisdictions, the Judean region in the south, the Galilean region in the middle, and then the, the, um, the northern region. And they put a guy named Archelaus in charge of the south, Herod Antipas in charge of the Galilean region, and a guy named Philip in charge of the north. The reason is, is they were the three surviving sons of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was a maniac, an absolute maniac. Uh, one story says that he had a dream that his sons were going to try to take over the kingdom from him. So he woke them up the next morning and he took them swimming in the family swimming pool and he drowned them. They were eight, nine, and 11. This guy was a lunatic. He was also a genius. He figured out how to move a mountain to give 10 years of drinking water without another drop of rain in the desert. This guy was absolutely a genius maniac. And so they figured, well, if his three kids could survive him, they could lead. So Archelaus in the south, um, Herod Antipas in the, in the Galilean region, and Philip in, in the north. Now in 22 AD, uh, Archelaus had made such a right mess of Judea that Caesar replaced him with a guy named Pilate. Yep, that Pilate. So you have Herod the Great, you have Caesar Augustus, you have Julius Caesar, and you have the three sons of Herod. Now Pilate was called the eagle. And Herod Antipas was called the fox. Can you see later why when Jesus said things like foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head? Remember there's this one time it says, they, they said to him, they said, Herod's trying to kill you. And he says, you tell that fox exactly where I am. See, this was the days of Caesar Augustus. And what was going on in the days of Caesar Augustus. Well, just some quick facts that you could find in any Roman history book. As a matter of fact, it was just a terrible time to be alive. There was a guy named Germanicus. Germanicus was a Roman general, and 50 years before Jesus, he conquered the west side of the empire by slaughtering everyone of a different race who would not agree to be slaves. This was the days of Caesar Augustus. A guy named Pompey took 12 million slaves in the days of Caesar Augustus. Augustus. A guy named Titus conquered Jerusalem and took 500 people a day as slaves. For amusement, the history books tell us that he would nail people to crosses in weird formations just to keep his soldiers occupied and not bored in the days of Caesar Augustus. There, there was a guy named Cassius. Cassius enslaved 30,000 people from a region called Megdala. That's where Mary Magdalene is from. And he famously made an edict that all women of that region were Roman property. So it was not illegal for a Roman soldier to rape any woman from that region because Roman soldiers need their property. This was the days of Caesar. Augustus. Maybe the most famous story was of a Roman general named Varus. Varus in 14 AD crucified 2,000 people in one day in a place called Sepphoris because there was rumors of a messianic uprising. In other words, there was rumors of someone walking around Galilee claiming to be a new kind of king to free Israel from the oppressive regime of the Roman Empire. So Varus went in under the authority of Caesar and he slaughtered the lot. 2,000 crucifixions in a day. They lined the streets of Sepphoris up with the, crucif with, with the crosses so that people could observe what happens if you cross Caesar, which leads to this question. Who was 14 years old in 14 AD? And where was he from? He was from Nazareth. Nazareth is like a kilometer away from Sepphoris, which leads to this question. Where do Roman generals get their crosses from? They don't walk around with them. They had to employ the local carpenters to make the crosses in order to fulfill the crucifixions, which leads to this question. How many, how many crosses do you reckon Jesus had to make in his life before he was put on one? It, this, this was then followed up in 18 AD. He burned Emmaus to the ground. This, this made Herod Antipas approach Caesar and say, listen, man, your general is out of control. Please, if you'll, if you'll just trust me, I'll keep these Galilean peasants under control. But you've got to get the military out of here for a little bit because they're being too 
cruel. And Caesar agreed to do this. Can you see now why years later, like 12, 13 years later, when another Galilean rabbi is walking around the Galilean region and he's claiming to be the son of God and a new kind of king, why people were trying to figure out a way to throw him off of a cliff? You can't have news like that getting back to Caesar. They might send Varus back in to destroy us. This is the days of Caesar Augustus. So who was ruling the Roman Empire? Well, there's a group of people called the Caesars. Julius Caesar, the first Caesar, he was known as being God in flesh. And then, of course, his great nephew, a guy named Octavius, took over. That was Caesar Augustus. He was the son of God. A guy named Tiberius, he ruled during Jesus' earthly ministry. And then, of course, there was Caligula, who was known for debauchery and terror. Then there was a maniac named Nero, who used to impale Christians with wooden sticks through their rectum with the goal of going through both holes at once. He would cover them in tar and set them on fire to keep his backyard a light. Then there was a guy named Vespasian who died of a head wound and supposedly resurrected. They, they knew him as the anti-Christ. And then there was Titus. He's the guy that conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And then, of course, there was the famous Domitian, the beast who comes from land and sea, who built four churches, ecclesias, to his honor at the main center of mercantilism in outside of Ephesus, a place called the Agora. And he made a rule, before you can buy and sell, you have to give an offering just for the divine privilege of having the Son of God rule you. And so from 78 AD to 92 AD, before you could buy and sell in the Roman Empire in Ephesus, you had to take the mark of the beast. This guy was performing incredible economic oppression on people who would not call anybody else God. These were the Caesars. In the days of Caesar Augustus. So in the days of Caesar Augustus, he ruled the whole world. He was the first person ever to unite the whole world. The, the idea was, is since Julius was God, then Augustus was the son of God who would rule the world. And since he was the son of God who would rule the world, he should be worshipped. This is a quote from the Roman historian Virgil. This is what it says, that in Caesar Augustus was the incarnate divine life in flesh. The one of only salvation can come to the earth, but through the name of Caesar Augustus. His accomplishments were engraved on monuments and hung in churches, they were called ecclesias, to his honor. They called him, according to Virgil, the one who was to come in order to bring salvation, peace on earth, and goodwill to all men. This was the days of Caesar Augustus. Does this language sound familiar to us? They said he would establish a kingdom of peace that would free men from all fear. That was according to Virgil as well. So if you're paying attention, the propagation, the propagation of the imperial cult or the propaganda around Augustus Caesar was he would bring peace on earth and goodwill to all men and free men from, from, the, from the world of fear. And he would be a supplier of bread for all people. This was the days of Caesar Augustus. And of course, there's a backstory to that. In, in 44 BC, a strange star appeared in the sky. Um, this happened to coincide with Julius Caesar's death and funeral. Now think about it. If you're a primitive person, you don't know the world's not flat. You've never seen a telescope in your life. You do know where every star is because that's, that was your compass. That's how you got around. And a guy who says he was God gets stabbed in the back by his best friend. And then at his funeral, it just so happens that a comet comes so close to earth that it lights up the day and night sky. According to Roman history, it lit up the day and night sky for seven days. Obviously a bit of an exaggeration because they're trying to get the meaning that Julius Caesar was God. Now, now astronomers today know exactly what happened. A comet came close to earth. They've actually named it Caesar's Comet. It's in a rock song from the 70s. But back then... Think about how you would think if you were them. You would think, that just proves that God died and that Julius Caesar has taken his place amongst the council of the gods. And of course, Octavius jumps on this and he says, see, that proves that my dad was God and now he is sitting at his rightful place in the council of the gods in the sky. So here's what happened. Caesar Augustus institutes a 12-day celebration of his birth. The idea was, is that since I'm God, I should be worshipped. And since I'm God, I should be worshipped primarily. So he institutes a 12-day celebration of his birth because one day isn't enough. It went from December 19th to December 31st every year, and it was called the 12 Days of Advent. 
It was called the Advent of Caesar Augustus. If on the first day of Christmas, when tri right? This kind of stuff. And of course, what they ended up doing is they ended up changing New Year's Day to January 1st. The reason is, is they wanted the new New Year's Day to coincide with the end of Caesar's 12-day birthday celebration. This is Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one being born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now remember, Caesar Augustus verified his deity as the Son of God because strange stars appeared in the sky at his father's funeral. Now how do you get word about that from Spain to India with no internet, no electricity, no printing press, and town criers are highly unreliable? Here's what they did, because back in those days, people in rural areas struggled differentiating between actual news from the government and fake news. Now, we're way past that today, but they struggled with that back then. And one of the ways you could know that it was actually from the government is they would put government propaganda on money. The reason is, is the money would find its way around the empire. And so the Caesar Augustus put out an advent coin. It was legal tender in the Roman Empire. And on the head side of the coin was Caesar Augustus. And on the tail side of the coin was a giant star. And around that giant star, it says, God saves us. Caesar Augustus, God saves us. Remember there's this one time where they were trying to trap Jesus in treason? And so they, they, they ask him, what about taxes to Caesar? And Jesus goes, I don't have a coin on me. Anybody got a coin? I need a coin. And somebody there said, I have a coin. And Jesus goes, huh, whose image is on the coin? And they said, well, Caesar's, which was a little bit of Jewish kung fu because the, the second command was don't carry idols around. In other words, I, you're trying to trap me, but I'm not the one carrying the image of somebody who says he's God, right? If I were you, I would keep Caesar what is Caesar's and I would keep God's what is God, which was the sort of a Jewish rabbi's way of wah, like just absolute kung fu. But one of the things we learn there is that in the kingdom of Caesar, he puts his image on money and people were commodities. But in the image of this Christ, he puts his image on people and the money is the commodity. Two totally different things. And so these wise men from Bethlehem are like, hey, Caesar has a star, so does our guy. And they come to Jerusalem looking for a guy. He says, hey, we've got to say. Remember what it goes on to say? It says, and all of Jerusalem was disturbed by this. Of course they were. Why? Because they didn't want to be rabble rousers around making Caesar come in with the military. But there was another group that says, we want to be free from that military regime. This was an amazing, this was more than just two teenagers trying to convince everybody they didn't do anything. This is an in-your-face confrontation to the oppression of the Roman Empire in the days of Caesar, Augustus. During Advent, Augustus offered forgiveness of sins and second chances to people who would give an offering of incense to him. They were commanded to say the Advent slogans all around the empire. Caesar is Lord. No other name on earth by which men can be saved. Caesar is Lord. There'll be peace on earth and goodwill to all men. This would have been, this would have been clamoring around all the villages of the empire during the 12 days of Advent. According to the historian Ethelbert Stauffer in his book, Christ and the Caesars, this is what he says. The entire empire would have been quaking with the Advent slogans, Caesar is Lord. They said he would be a multiplier of bread for all people. And they changed New Year's Day. Here is an account from a stone tablet in Prien, outside of Ephesus, of the Roman Senate trying to explain why they changed New Year's Day. Here it is. Because providence has set all things in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue that he might benefit all humankind by sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, and that he might end war and arrange all things well. Because he, Caesar, by his appearing, has surpassed all previous benefactors and leaves posterity no hope of another surpassing what he's done. A name above all names. And because the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good news, good news, gospel, for the world that came by reason of him. So words like good news and salvation and savior and all mankind, this was propaganda around Caesar. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, is that he didn't rule with peace, but with fear. He got followers by forced confession. 
He sent military in and you either converted or you died. It was incredibly effective. He financed his kingdom through excessive taxation of the poor and the afflicted. By one historical estimate, the people of Galilee were paying 87% taxes. 50% of their fish, 30% of their grain, 12.5% to Caesar himself, just for the divine privilege of having God rule you, the Romans' roads taxes, and the temple taxes. This is an unbelievably oppressive way to live in the days of Caesar Augustus. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read Luke chapter 2 with that as the backstory, and watch it come to life. Here we go. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the, the census should be taken in the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Another sermon for another time. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news. Hang on a second. Where have we heard that before? Good news was a specific word around what Caesar was bringing to the world. Now, this angel is using the same language about somebody else. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Christ. He is Lord. Like the angels just using the Roman propaganda that they were using to prop up Caesar. He's going, no, 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 no. No, I've seen how this ends. And there is someone to benefit all humankind. And there is someone to bring peace on earth. And there is a Savior. And his name is Christ. And he is Lord. So the next time in the Christmas season, you sing a song like, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. He's the Christ. He's the Christ. He is Lord. May it not just be a mindless hymn that we sing, but may it, may it remind us that we are building a throne for the one who gets the last word. This is a sign to you that you'll find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to all mankind. So that's my best effort at explaining what happened. But anytime you open the Bible, you want to ask two questions. What happened? And what's happening in me right now because of what happened? Here's my question for all of us is in our life, who's our Lord? Does the narrative of our life show the world that Caesar is Lord or that Christ is? If someone looked at the narrative of our life, would they go, Jesus is Lord? Or would they go, Caesar is? See, Caesar ruled by violence. Jesus ruled by peace. Caesar ruled by, by ruling. Christ ruled by serving. Christ submitted his liberty and power to the higher ethic of love. Caesar, Caesar ruled by excessive taxation and trusting the government to take care of everything. Jesus ruled by instilling love as the highest ethic and trusting us to act in love to our brothers and sisters. So if somebody looked at the narrative of our life, what narrative is being told? The narrative of Caesar or the narrative of Christ? So what's this mean? It means that Jesus is Lord and he gets the last word. Caesar doesn't get the last word, Jesus does. Anger doesn't get the last word, Jesus does, because anger belongs to the narrative of Caesar. Lust doesn't get the last word, Jesus does, because that belongs to the narrative of Caesar. Lies don't get the last word, Jesus does. Unforgiveness doesn't get the last word, Jesus does. Feeling disheartened doesn't get the last word, Jesus does. Cancer doesn't get the last word, Jesus does. Pain doesn't get the last word, Jesus does. Greed doesn't get the last word, Jesus does. Failure, shame, divorce, cruelty, none of those things get the last word. That's the message of Christmas, that hope has flooded into our current situation and our life is not simply a repeat of yesterday because we never know what God might do to our today that fundamentally changes everything. And these things don't get the last word. They belong to the narrative of Caesar, but there's a better narrative. So a couple of questions. What's oppressing you right now? What are you tempted to say, this gets the last word? And I would urge us to change how we think about that. The word for that is repentance. Let, let's say it this way, is Jesus Lord or is the oppressor? Is Jesus Lord or is the oppressor? I, I would ask a third question. Is there any person right now that we're actively, through our actions or inactions, oppressing? It may be one way, last way to think about this today is, if the message of your life was on a coin, what does it say? If the message of, on your life was passed around as a coin, 
What would people who observe your life, if we weren't allowed to tell them that we were believers, would the narrative of our life say, obviously, Jesus is Lord? Or is the narrative of our life telling the narrative of Caesar? I bless you, my brothers and sisters, to let Jesus get bigger, the cross work better, the resurrection to be central, and scriptures get bigger, not smaller. I hope in listening to this brief thing that the Christmas story has come more alive to you than ever before, that hope has invaded the world, and the narrative of Caesar never gets the last word. May we show that truth to the world around us every single day. Merry Christmas, everybody.
everyone at Cornerstone family in Tri-Series and thank you very much Pastor Joey and Meredith for this opportunity. I miss you guys. Looking forward to being back with you very soon. Merry Christmas. Adlan Cruz. Hey everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hopefully you enjoyed all of our guests that were on uh, Madeline Cruz, Brian Poppins, and so great. our good friend Shane Willard. I know those guys have been a blessing in my life and in Meredith's yes. life, and I know they've been a blessing in your life. And so anyway, from our house to your house, yes. we just want to say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Enjoy you your families. Enjoy your time together. We'll see you on Sunday, but God bless you, and have a great Christmas. Love you guys. Bye-bye.